Please tell me about your family. First of all, I was born and raised here in Savannah, Georgia. I grew up here in Savannah. My ancestors, my mother's people, was from Lebanon. My father came from Armenia. They both met here in Savannah. My mother was a housewife. Tell a little bit about how they met. My grandfather had a friend here who's an Armenian friend and a friend of my father. My father had escaped from Armenia because the Turks were killing Armenian people. And he had this friend here in Savannah. He came and this friend asked him if he'd like to find a good wife here. Then they met my mother. And then, of course, they get married and they had 12 children. Only eight of us lived. My mother was a housewife. My daddy had a general merchandise store. He made his own ice cream. He sold beer and wine, and he worked from 6 in the morning to about 12 midnight. We had a good life then. My father was killed when I was 11 years old. I had to work ever since. I helped my mother get my sister and brothers through school. Well, I had five sisters and two brothers. My parents did not encourage me in my art, but my mother did some artwork while she was in school, and I used to go through her papers and I see some of her artwork. But it never encouraged me because we were poor and we just couldn't afford it. And when I was going to school, they only had art class maybe once a month. Sometimes, some month they didn't have it. There was this girl that bought a paint box to school, and I always wish I could have had a paint box like that. But I remember being five years old, I got a piece of chalk and was drawn in the sidewalk. I got a whooping for defacing public property. And so, anyway, I've always liked to draw ever since I was about five or six years old. I've always remembered that. That was my beginning. What or who inspired you to become an artist most? You know, I really can't recall, but I did know that I loved art when I was in school. And my daddy had, no, my mother had this man working with her after my daddy got killed, the black man. He was drawing faces of people. And I thought it was very good, and I was inspired by that. But other than that, I had never had any art training. And when I used to have a hobby, raising plants, working on, ra- raising animals, see, I lost my hearing when I was two years old from Scottish fever. I couldn't hear it. I had a problem there. And I had a difficult time going through school, but I've always loved art. It was there with me. Was it a complete loss of Oh, it was a nerve damage. I had a scarlet fever for, for about six months, and then she noticed my hearing was lost when I was two years old. Now my daddy, being he's from the old country, didn't believe in doctors, and he wouldn't let mother take me there. And so she said I had a fever for six months, and then she noticed my hearing was gone. So I don't consider it a handicap. I consider it a blessing. Because without my hearing, I hear it in my eyes instead of my ears. And with my eyes, I see all the beauty, I see all the movement, I see all the expression, everything, uh, even the moss blowing, the trees, and uh, the animals, if you watch them, you can see the ears point in a certain direction. If there was the danger, they'd back hump up, and they were my ears for me. So I had a way, anything that was strong, like a strong smell, like a smell that long for people did, if a storm was coming, or uh, if a fire... I had my, what I call my sick tent. So these were some of God's gifts to me, but really inspired my painting in the future. You know, if you go through nature, if you notice that everything God created has curve, has rhythm, it has no straight line. Only man made straight line. But if you go, the Indian believed that every, whenever a person dies, he come back into your spirit to an animal, to uh, some kind of plant, anything. And sometimes you really look, you can see the tree spirits. You see a face of animal, a person, a thing. And some of them, you can see a swan, you can see an elephant, you can see an old man, you can see anything. So these are beautiful things. If you look with your eyes, you can see them. The black people believe that whenever a baby is born, and if you find a tree, with a hole in the tree, and if you pass the baby through the hole in the tree, it will never get sick. It will always be healthy. You know, not being able to hear, I didn't have any playmate. I never had any human playmate, but I did have animals for playmate. I had three dogs. I had about 18 heads of billy goat. 
And I would run through the pasture barefooted as a child. I was always happy. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to have all these things. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to hear things. But with my you eyes, I see some... Did you on a farm? On a farm. Well, not exactly a farm. It was on the edge of the city. My mother had a stable and about nine acres of land. And, of course, we had one cow, one horse. And then my grandfather gave me the billy goat. He, he had bought a female goat on a barbecue. Well, they, he found out she was with Kit, so he didn't want to kill her, so he gave her to me. And I, from her, I raised a lot of little ones, and also I had another male, and I've got 18 heads of goat. So running through the pasture, everywhere as I go, the goats follow me, single file. We would run through the pasture, and if, if I sit down, they sit down. If I lay down, they lay down. They always stop and sit around me in circles. And sometimes the days are so warm and I get up under the oak trees, you know, in the shade and look up the sky. In the sky I see all these formations of people, castles, of frogs, animals, everything. It was so beautiful. It's one of the most relaxing things. And then you would fall asleep and you dreamed about all these things. It was very beautiful. Did you have any schooling in art or did you learn more by doing? I never had any uh, training in art because my daddy would kill, mother couldn't afford it. We were lucky if we got anything to eat. And when I was 22 years old, I went to Atlanta, December of 52, I think it was. I was 22 years old. And about November 53, I was so depressed. I had nothing to do on the weekend. I would roam through, through Richard's department store. And I saw these plastic figurines, you know, these plastic figurines they pulled in the mold, and of course you're supposed to paint it, put a glaze over it. I had bought some cheap oil paint, and I had these little Coca-Cola stopper make my paint in it, and paint these figurines, and take and put a glaze on it, and take it home whenever I got a chance to go home, about once every six weeks. I gave them to my mother, and my sister would get those things, play with them, and break them. So I thought it a waste of time. Since I had the paint and very cheap brushes, I finally got some cheap canvas to paint on. I'll show you one of my original paintings. I started copying from a magazine. I've always wanted to paint, but I didn't have any way to get out to paint. But I stayed in my room, so I started trying to paint. And I began, like everybody told me, I had talent, but I needed more work. So one man at the office where I work at, at Martin Brothers General Lab, he heard that I was one to be an artist, one to paint. He was an artist himself. He was an old man, about 70-something years old. He retired. His name is Robert Harner. And he had an oil paint box. And he loaned me his paint box, his brushes. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. So I would stop painting. And he came up one night to my uh, apartment up on the third floor. The old man couldn't hardly make it. He had hot trouble. He gave me a demonstration how to use the oil and how to paint a seascape. And that was the last time, that was the only time he ever came up. He had been but about an hour there. He had to go. But later on, I bought some watercolor paper and watercolor paint, very cheap, and I stopped painting the paper, and I was doing little flowers and a lot of still life. I was giving them away. People loved them, admired them, I was giving them away. They kept telling me I had talent, keep painting. And so finally, I left Atlanta in April of 56, moved to Albany, Georgia. First art association I've joined into was Albany Art Association at Radiant Spring, I remember that. And we went with a group, we went painting outdoor at a red shack. That was a beautiful painting, I don't remember what happened to it. But that was one of my first experiences going out with a group and to paint. And we all learned from each other. What artists, either famous artists or local artists, do you admire and that you feel have influenced your work? The most famous artist that I admire very much is Vincent Van Gogh. He was my favorite master. After reading some books on him, I feel like that I have the same relationship with him. You know, coming up at Harbury and living by yourself, you know, Vincent's painting to live, just like we have to have food to live. A lot of time he would have starved for death while he should be when he went to painting. And to look at his work, especially the sunflower and the ray of the sun, he stared at the face of the painting. It was something beautiful about every brushstroke he made. 
That was my favorite master. And then a local artist was old Rayford Wood. He does a lot of realistic scenery, country scenery. He does the subject matter I like. He was a friend of mine, and he had a hearing problem. We used to go out painting together. But most of my great experience is getting books from the library. If I have anything, subject matter I want to learn on, I know the technique of how to paint with oil, watercolor, pastel, acrylic, ink, a Japanese book on the Sumi ink, and drawing. Drawing is the foundation of painting. That was number one. But you got to learn to draw before you can paint. So most of my lessons come from library, but I couldn't afford to go to art school. What media do you work in, and which do you enjoy most? My first medium was oil. My second medium was watercolor. And then I have tried pastel. Pastel was too much dust, and oil, I was, uh, couldn't stand the curtain kind and linseed oil because I have an allergy. And watercolor seemed the best choice to medium. Watercolor was a happy medium. And of course, I used French Arche paper. The best paper that can be done is pure rag and acid-free. And, of course, canvas. When I did use canvas, I used uh, white cotton canvas. Also, sometimes I can afford a linen canvas. But I went to acrylic painting later on, but I came back to oil. I mean, watercolor, excuse me. Went back to watercolor. And watercolor, I have more freedom. And it's like a very happy medium. You can capture the scenery at the spur of a moment and the feeling, just like somebody singing a song or playing the piano, and you can complete a painting. And watercolor is my first choice. What kinds of subject matter do you paint, and what is the range of sizes of your work? I love country scenery. I love animals. I love horses. I love a chicken. I love a billy goat. These are the things I like to in. The old shack, I've always remembered the shacks and uh, the... They're so homely, they're down to earth. The country scenery, everything I painted and go back later in the future to paint, it is gone forever. This is like recording history. And a lot of some of the old scenery around town and Savannah, historic houses, anything that people will not see in the future, it will be recorded. And it's something that I can relate with because everybody seems so humble. I want to read you one poem. I have written this poem in my Christian card one year, The Meek and the Humble. I seek for beauty in all things, even people like the seashell, driftwood, and all the gifts of God that are cast upon the shore of time. I seek happiness not in castle of king, but in a humble little cavern where the meek live more closely to nature. I am contented with the peace I found with the birth of a Christ child and a lowly stable God gift to mankind. A lot of the old shacks and bonds are disappearing. People modernize the bond with concrete block and have no style or anything. It doesn't feel living. But the old bond seems to be relaxed. It has seemed so cozy and comfortable. So is the home. These are where the people seem to be the happiest. When you see a fancy home with a lot of straight lines and it's all tight, tight, it just doesn't have a feeling of humbleness. It doesn't have a feeling of being living. It's more of a showcase instead of a home. What places and people or things that you have painted have touched your life the most? Back in 1969, I saw an ad in the paper where Oki Plantation, about 50 miles here, up around Clio, was having a art festival. I had to ask a lady friend of mine to go with me. We're going to see what it's all about. Where was it? It's really at Oki Plantation. That's between uh, Springfield and, and uh, Clio. Well, going to Oki Plantation up a dirt road, I thought I found a treasure, a place to paint. There was a lot of old shack. Wagon with mule, pig, billy goat, turkey, geese, hound. I thought it was so beautiful. I stopped and took pictures of all along the way. We head to Oki. On the way to Oki, we stopped at one black man's place. Old William, uh, 
Oh, William. And he had gold teeth and all, but in back of his trunk he had some basket, good old basket. So I asked Joe William where did he get the basket. And he said, oh, Mr. Bird, Mr. Bird, four miles past Oki. So we went to visit Oki first and seen the art show, and I told this lady friend of mine I wanted to find the basket maker. And we asked everybody where was Mr. Bird place. But nobody ever heard of Mr. Bird. Finally, we asked an old black man in the old Clio Kilde Road, where is Mr. Bird, the man that made the basket? He said, oh, you're looking for Mr. Burn, Mr. Henry Burn." And I said, that might be the one. He said, yes, he showed me how to get there. We're just only a few miles down the road. But I discovered Henry Byrne has a basket shed, and the house was so beautiful. It was, a, it was the most beautiful feeling to discover that. And his wife, she was a woman of the sun, of earth. And they were both so humble. So she had poppy bloom around her house. And to me, that was, I feel like I've discovered where I want to be in Effingham County. So anyway, I took some pictures and I went on down the road with a lady friend of mine. We did a painting of uh, Johnny Lovett house. Had clothes in the line, dog running, kids around. He playing the guitar on the porch. This was one of my first paintings of that way. And so about several months later, I went back and found Henry Byrne's house again and took the photograph I have taken of Mary Byrne's flower. She asked me to come back up and have dinner someday. So I made an appointment to come back another time, and she had fried chicken, all kind of food on the table. I was out painting her chicken coop, her roost. It's in the hallway. So that's how Mary Byrne, we were going back and forth there to see her and painting they adopted me and called me one of the children. And so there I had a place, and everybody around the county knew me for Mary Byrne. And I was invited to all the different people's house to paint their farmland, their uh, home, their barn. I would make feel welcome everywhere I went. So this Mary Byrne touched my life more. And uh, all around that area, so now most all of that scene was gone. A lot of that stuff been burned down and destroyed or torn down. It's gone forever. Every year around Christmas time, I was very fortunate to get a cushion or quilt blanket by the hands of Mary Byrne. She made quilt, her husband made basket. But I was very fortunate. This is one of Mary Byrne's cushion right here. It, she always put the date on some year. There's two more over there on that chair. There's two more on that quilt footstool. See them two over there? I have a lot of quilt blankets in this chest. If you look on the day, you'll see the date on it. I put the paper on the rocking chair. I got that other one down there too. That there's another one down there. One of my favorite, one of my most favorite pieces in this whole house is my little shadow box of an early American kitchen. Everything is mostly handmade. I did three small paintings in there, which is post stamp side. Those are my smallest, and my largest painting uh, is a watercolor. In this other room here, it's about five foot tall and about three foot wide. That's about the largest one I did. What are some of your favorite paintings? Well, some of my favorite painting is a country store, uh, country store, and uh, it's from Guyton, Georgia. It has so many beautiful things around there, and it's all country. And one and another fa favorite store is right here in Savannah, in the corner of and Gordon Street, which is now gone forever. That's the red store with the yellow awning. And then the daffodil fields up in Bluffin. And every spring, I look forward to the daffodil fields, and it just kind of lifts up my spirits because after going through cold weather, it's so beautiful to see the daffodil in bloom. And I try to keep these. Now the field is, is beginning to lose it lots because old Mr. Huggin, who owned the field, had passed away, and nobody taken care of it like it used to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, the produce was another one of my paintings, which I have prints of it. I worked on it for two years, off and on, because there were so many things happened, but I finally have print made of it. What other kinds of art and artists do you admire? I admire Andrew White. He's one of my uh, favorite American artists. I admire Wesley Holman for his watercolor, too. And his subjects matter. Those are two I, I admire very much. 
How about local artists? You mentioned this uh, Pearl Kaminsky. Well, Pearl Kaminsky, one, she does beautiful collage. Lynn Grant, she does beautiful watercolor too. Sharon Tassin, who is one of a great, I, I admire very much. We used to go painting together for about nine years. And I influenced her very much. She was an artist always, but I influenced her very much. Not being able to hear good with my ears, but I hear my eyes. When I see the Savannah Symphony play in the park and on River Street, it is so beautiful, it brings tears to my eyes. But I want to capture this from Cambridge. All the movements they make, and the curve, the violin, the bass fiddle, the drum, everything is so beautiful, it kind of moved me to paint these. And these are some of my favorite subjects matter also. Do you work only on your art or do you have another source of income? I'm a general lab technician, which is a farm art to create things and every piece of denture, a crown and bridge is, is different for every person. It's never the same. And this is uh, the income that I've worked with for 42 years. Would you prefer to be able to concentrate only on your art if you could? I am definitely planning on to. When I, as soon as I retire, I'm going to concentrate more on my artwork, and I'm going to travel a lot, and I hope to live in the country. And a little shack, if I can, have me some chicken, a garden, and a hound. And I'm going to have me a fireplace and live comfortable and happy. Do you always work alone? In the beginning, I've always worked alone because I didn't know that anybody else can, you know, paint. But later in life, once in a while, some people who want to be artists or some who are artists, like to, we like to go together, take a lunch, and go out in the country somewhere or go on a long trip. We do painting. But sometimes there are young people who like to paint. They can go, go along and join me. I'd be glad to teach them what I know. And if they can't take it, they should stay home. But if they really want an artist, a real artist, to really go and, you know, really capture uh, beautiful work, and they, they, they're they learning from somebody who had a lot of hard experience and learned the hard way, and I'd be glad to pass on everything I know. Sharon Dillon was a, was a good artist, but she was a little, a little intimidated. She was a little bashful. She was shy. But she didn't know, she was always raised in the city. She was protected all the time. But she go with me, I opened so many doors. We went out in the country, she met people, she learned about animals. She has all kind of beautiful experience. I helped her find the subject matter to do for her book on where my feather puller come from. And we went, I gave her a lot of ideas and things where to go and the subject matter to find and she got very bold. And then from there, she got ahead of me and then she became very famous. One of the most famous paintings she did was a view from River Street, which I had got permission to go from across the Vanna River. I had got permission to go over there and Sharon did this painting and from there she had print and then she hit the top. She went very famous. Another artist friend of mine was a young fellow who went to Savannah College Art Design School. He was having such a rough life, but I taught him. He was doing dry brush technique and watercolor, but I taught him how to do the wet and to wet technique. He was a gifted artist, a wildlife artist, and then he learned the freedom of watercolor. He became very bold. He's very gifty. He's uh, very mostly a fine type artist. When I first met young Steve, uh, he didn't have much, but he was very gifty. But he was hungry when I first met him. I asked him if he had anything to eat. He said no. I said, well, sit down at the table, and I have something I'll feed you. Because I found out his food was being stored at, at the dorm where he was staying. And so I gave him a key to my house. I told him, I said, it's easier for me to fix for two people than it is for one. And I said, my, I have plenty of lunch meat in the refrigerator. I said, you come and eat your lunch here anytime you want. He ate his breakfast there, he ate his lunch. This is how he survived. What values and philosophy do you live by? And 
have influenced your art? To speak about values and all, I will tell you something. I dedicated a Christmas card I had made in 1972. I dedicate this card to my mother's father, Karen Ganim, who was 92 years old. He came into this country from Beirut, Lebanon in 1905. From a biblical land, he brought with him a strong religious faith and passed it on to us. To all who know him, he is like a prophet who speaks of God, of beauty, and of love. He has faith in the sea he strove in the garden of love, for he has reaped many a rich reward. These I share with families and friends and neighbors. During my youth, he once taught me, if a man goes through life and don't learn to find and enjoy the beauties of life in nature, he is not living, he is dead. Hence I have found art, poetry, beauty, and love as a university language, even in cooking, one of the most important ingredients is love, a joy to serve. One of my greatest experiences in life is being able to transmute love into an in intimate object and giving it life. Alive, it becomes a part of me, a friend, a rock, a broken shell, an old shoe a personality value all its own. Even colors speak for me. A ticking clock is a heartbeat, and from my heart warm grows of love, all added to the beauty and charm of Christmas. I wish to share with you the best gift I tie with heart string, the joy of Christmas and love. What advice would you give to young artists starting out if you are very creative and if you love what you do, you know everybody has a medium of expression. And you should use that medium. It is a gift from God. If you don't use it, you would lose it. But some people can dance, some can sing, some can play some music and instruments, some can be an automobile mechanic, and some paint. Some make sculpture and all, but my medium is painting. And I think that every person has a medium of expression. They should use it. And if they don't use it, they would lose it. And I think you should develop it and, and you know, pursue it and keep learning everything you can. Because I learn every day. I never stop learning. And I enjoy everything I do. Talking about so many people been influenced by my art, I have an old lady friend, Ann Evan, who writes children's stories. When she see the prism in my windows when it cast the rainbows across my room, she wrote a book on the rainbow bridge, a young boy who crossed the bridge to an artist in the sky and learned to paint. So this book is very beautiful, but it has not been published yet. I have a nephew who, when he was about five years old, he'd been influenced by me. He did a little painting for me when he was sick. Of Christ on the cross, he did one of an eagle. Just recently, he turned 10, and he wrote and illustrated a book on a children's story of his two little turtles. And he is now stopped painting. I taught him how to do watercolor, so he's doing very well. Someday when you die, what would you like to be remembered most for? Well, my art is a memorial to me. My art would be left to the future generation to enjoy. They are my thought, my memory, they are my heart, they are my love. These I like to be shared with everyone.